What's at the core of achieving the good life? The major key to the good life? The major key is not in learning how to set goals. It is not in learning how to better manage your time. It is not in mastering the attributes of leadership. Every day, in 1,000 different ways, we are trying to improve ourselves by learning how to do things. We spend a lifetime gathering knowledge in classrooms, in textbooks, and through experiences. Now, if knowledge is power, if knowledge is the forerunner to success, then why do we fall short of our objectives? Why, in spite of all our knowledge and in spite of our collective experiences, do we find ourselves aimlessly wandering, settling for a life of existence rather than a life of substance? There may be many answers to this question. Your answers may be different from your associates, your spouses, or your friends. While there may be many answers to this question, the fundamental answer is the absence of discipline. Applying all that we know, that's the key word, discipline. Self-discipline. We might add one more word here, consistent. Consistent self-discipline. It doesn't really matter how smart you are or how much you know if you don't use it. It doesn't really matter that you graduated magna cum laude if you're stuck in a low-paying job. It doesn't really matter if you attended every seminar that comes to town if you don't apply what you've learned. Better than knowledge is applied knowledge. And once we've applied our knowledge, we must study the results of that process. Apply our knowledge, study the results, refine our approach, and finally, by trying, observing, refining, and trying again, our knowledge will inevitably produce worthy, admirable results. And with the joy and results of our efforts, we continue to apply, to learn, to observe, to fuel our ambition with the positive reinforcement of continued progress. Pretty soon, we'll find that we're swept into a spiral of achievement, a vertical rise to success. And the ecstasy of that total experience makes for a life of triumph over tragedy, dullness, and mediocrity. But for this whole process to work for us, we must first master the art of discipline. Self-discipline. Consistent self-discipline. It takes consistent self-discipline to master the art of setting goals, to master the art of time management, to master the art of leadership, to master the art of parenting and relationships. If we don't make consistent self-discipline part of our daily lives, the results we seek will be sporadic and elusive. It takes a consistent effort to truly manage our valuable time, or we'll be consistently frustrated. Our time will be eaten up by others whose demands are stronger than our own. It takes discipline to conquer the nagging voices in our minds. The fear of failure, the fear of success, the fear of poverty, the fear of a broken heart. It takes discipline to keep trying when that nagging voice within us brings up the possibility of failure. It takes discipline to admit our errors and recognize our limitations. The voice of the human ego speaks to all of us sometimes. The voice of ego says that we should magnify our value beyond our results. It leads us to exaggerate, to not be totally honest. It takes discipline to be totally honest, both with ourselves and with others. Be certain of one thing. Every exaggeration of the truth, once detected by others, destroys our credibility and makes all that we say and do suspect. As soon as a business colleague figures out that we tend to exaggerate, guess what? They'll always think we exaggerate, and they'll never quite hold us in the same regard again. The tendency to exaggerate, distort, or even withhold the truth is an inherent part of all of us. It starts when we're kids. Johnny says, I didn't do it. Well, maybe Johnny didn't do it, but he probably had something to do with it. And then it continues when we're adults. Exaggerating the benefits of a product to make a sale. Exaggerating our net worth to impress old friends. Exaggerating how close we are to closing a deal to impress the boss. And only an all-out disciplined assault can overcome this tendency. It takes discipline to change a habit, because habits are formed a little bit each day. Every day, once habits are formed, they act like a giant cable, an almost unbreakable instinct that only long-term disciplined activity can change. We must unweave every strand of the cable of habits slowly and methodically until the cable that once held us in bondage becomes nothing more than scattered strands of wire. It takes the consistent application of a new discipline, a more desirable one, to overcome one which is less desirable. It takes discipline to plan, it takes discipline to execute our plan, it takes discipline to look with full objectivity at the results of our applied plan. And it takes discipline to change either our plan or our method of executing that plan if the results are poor. It takes discipline to be firm when the world throws opinions at our feet. 
It takes discipline to ponder the value of someone else's opinion when our pride and our arrogance lead us to believe that we are the only ones with the answers. With this consistent discipline applied to every area of our lives, we can discover untold miracles and uncover unique possibilities and opportunities. Now, if discipline is the key word, and if discipline is the key action, then what exactly is discipline? One good answer might be, discipline is a constant human awareness of the need for action, and a conscious act by us to implement that action. Discipline is an awareness of the constant need for action, and a conscious act to implement that action. If our awareness and our implementation occur at the same time, then we begin a valued sequence of disciplined activity. Now, here's the other side of discipline. If there's considerable time that passes between the moment of awareness and the time of our implementation, then that is called procrastination. Procrastination. Doing it tomorrow instead of today. Procrastination is almost the exact opposite of discipline. The voice within us says, get it done. Discipline then says, do it now. Do it to the best of your ability, today, tomorrow, and always, until finally, the worthy deed becomes instinctive. Procrastination says, later, tomorrow, whenever I get a chance. Procrastination also says, do what is necessary to get by, or to impress others. Do what you can, but not what you must. In every circumstance we face, we are constantly presented with these two choices. Do it now, or do it later. Discipline and procrastination, a choice between a disciplined existence, bearing the fruit of achievement and contentment, or procrastination, the easy life for which the future will bear no fruit, only the bare branches of mediocrity. The rewards of a disciplined life are great, but they're often delayed until sometime in the future. The rewards for the lack of discipline are immediate, but they are minor in comparison to the immeasurable rewards of consistent self-discipline. An immediate reward for lack of discipline is a fun day at the beach. But future reward of discipline is owning the beach. For most, we choose today's pleasure rather than tomorrow's fortune. So, how can you get rid of the easy distractions? How can you keep your mind on what you're trying to do? How can you keep an attitude of doing it all, and doing it now? How can you make the choice of discipline over procrastination? How can you stay focused on your ambitions? How can you avoid conversations at the water cooler, and keep your focus on your work? You've got to really work on your consistent self-discipline on a daily basis, or you'll find yourself distracted. Distracted by negative thoughts, distracted by negative people, distracted by water cooler chatter. And pretty soon, depending on the type of people you've associated with, distracted by doubt within yourself. Never underestimate the power of influence and associations, and never underestimate the power of your own consistent self-discipline. Now, let's take a closer look at discipline, at the three steps to becoming disciplined. First, true discipline is not the easiest option. Most people would rather sleep until 10 than get up at 6. It's easier to go to bed late, sleep late, show up late, leave early. It's easier not to read, it's easier to turn on the television than to open a book. It's easier to do just enough than to do it all. Waiting is always easier than acting. Trying is always easier than doing. Imagine what life would be like if we didn't have to make our bed in the morning, or keep our garage clean, or pay our taxes, or show up for work. Tomorrow, wouldn't it be fascinating if we didn't have to do these things? Wouldn't it be fascinating? What do you suppose would become of us? You're right, not much. For whatever the reason, the system we live in and contribute to is designed to make the easiest things in life the least profitable, while the most profitable seems to be the most difficult. Our world is and always will be a constant battle between the life of ease and its momentary rewards, and a life of discipline and its far more significant rewards. Each has its own price. The price of discipline or the price of regret. We will pay one or the other. What we wish we had done is the voice of regret speaking in a sorrowful tone at a time when there is no going back. This is regret. No second chance. No, what would I do differently? Choose one or the other, but both will have their price. The price of discipline or the price of regret. One costs pennies, the other a fortune. Dewey said there are hundreds of young men who would die for the truth, but very few who would spend five years studying to know what the truth is. Dying for the truth is much more dramatic than the discipline of studying a little piece at a time, one day at a time, one month at a time. But in the big picture, is dying for the truth really easier than adhering to the daily disciplines? The first lesson of discipline is that it isn't the easiest option. The second lesson of discipline is that it's a full-time activity. 
And we've said that the best form of discipline is consistent self-discipline. You see, the discipline that it takes to make your bed every day is the same discipline necessary for success in the world of business. The discipline to organize your garage is the same discipline to organize your business. All disciplines carry through to affect all parts of our lives. If we're disciplined in just one area and lazy in another, guess what? Pretty soon, the lazy side will creep in and destroy the disciplined side. The bad habits in one area of our life will eventually destroy our self-discipline in the areas we've been working on. Consistency cannot be inconsistent. Discipline is the mind being trained to control our lives. Discipline is a set of standards which we've selected as a personal code of conduct. Discipline is imposing on ourselves the requirements for honoring these standards. Once we've adopted these standards of behavior and conduct, we're committed to honor them. And if we don't, then there can be no disciplined activity. We find ourselves announcing our standards to our relatives, our friends, our associates. We shout our beliefs and condemn those who believe any differently. But then we don't want the talk. We end up acting in a way far different from the beliefs we've shouted. We tell our kids that the TV is rotting their minds, yet we spend our evenings in front of it. We tell our employees that they must take advantage of every minute of the working day, yet we spend three hours of lunch. Do as I say, not as I do. This is inconsistent. This leads to a loss of credibility among those who watch us. And more importantly, this leads to a loss of credibility within ourselves. The only thing worse than one who is inconsistent in applying their self-imposed disciplines is one who has never considered the need or the value of discipline at all. These people seem to wander aimlessly, changing procedures, changing standards, changing loyalties, and shifting frequently from one commitment to another, leaving behind a trail of broken friendships, unfinished projects, and unfulfilled promises. All because of a discipline that was either non-existent or imposed so infrequently that it was ineffective. Here's the third step to becoming consistently self-disciplined. One is realizing that discipline isn't the easiest option. Two, discipline is a full-time activity, day by day, every day. And the third step to becoming self-disciplined is really a philosophy that holds one of life's unique promises. It simply says, for every disciplined effort, there is a multiple reward. That's one of life's great arrangements. It's like the law of sowing and reaping. In fact, it's an extension of the biblical law that says, if you sow well, you reap well. Now here's a unique part of the law of sowing and reaping. Not only does it suggest that we'll all reap what we've sown, it also suggests that we'll reap much more. Life is full of laws that both govern and explain behaviors, but this may well be the major law we need to understand. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. What a concept. If you render unique service, your reward will be multiplied. If you're fair, honest, and patient with others, your reward will be multiplied. If you give more than you expect to receive, your reward is more than you expect. But remember, the key word here, as you might well imagine, is discipline. Everything of value requires care and attention. Everything of value requires discipline. Children require discipline. They must have a structure built for them. They must have boundaries to work within so they feel secure and comfortable to explore and grow. They must learn to recognize what's right and what's wrong, what's acceptable behavior, what's not acceptable. Children require unwavering discipline, consistent discipline, or they'll be confused as to how they're supposed to behave. Likewise, our thoughts require discipline. We must set up our inner boundaries, our code of conduct, or our thoughts will be confused. And with confused thoughts, we'll end up being hopelessly lost in the maze of life. And confused thoughts produce confused results. Look around you at this very moment in time. What might you be doing that needs attention? Perhaps you're listening to this program as you drive along in traffic. Lung your horn at someone ahead of you who isn't driving at the speed you'd like. Perhaps you're listening alone because you've had a disagreement with someone you love, or someone who loves you, and your anger won't allow you to speak to that person. Wouldn't this be an ideal time to examine your need for a new discipline? Perhaps you're on the brink of giving up or starting over or starting out. And the only missing ingredient to your incredible success story in the future is a new and self-imposed discipline that will make you stay longer and try harder and work more intensely than you ever thought you possibly could. The most valuable form of discipline is the one that you impose on yourself. Don't wait for things to deteriorate so drastically that someone else must impose discipline into your life. 
wouldn't that be tragic? How could you possibly explain the fact that someone else thought more of you than you thought of yourself? That they forced you to get up early and get out into the marketplace when you would have been content to let success go to someone else who cared more about themselves? Your life, my life, the life of each one of us is going to serve as either a warning or an example. A warning of the consequences of neglect, self-pity, lack of direction and ambition, or an example of talent put to use, of discipline self-imposed, and of objectives clearly perceived and intensely pursued. The influence of those around us is so powerful. Many times we don't even realize we're being strongly influenced because it generally develops over an extended period of time. Peer pressure is an especially powerful form of influence because it is so subtle. If you're around people who spend all they make, chances are excellent that you will spend all you make. If you are around people who go to more ball games than concerts, chances are excellent that you'll do the same. If you're around people who don't read many books, chances are excellent you won't read many books. People around us can keep nudging us off course a little at a time until finally, 10 years from now, we find ourselves asking, how did I get here? Those subtle influences need to be studied carefully if we really want our lives to turn out the way we plan. Now, on this major point, let me give you three key questions to ask. This may help you to make a better analysis of your current associations. Here is the first question. Who am I around? Good question. Make a mental study of the major people with whom you most often associate. You've got to evaluate everybody who is within the circle of being able to influence you. So, major question. Who am I around? Next question. What are they doing to me? That's a major question to ask. What have they got me doing? What have they got me listening to? What have they got me reading? Where have they got me going? What have they got me thinking? How have they got me talking? And how have they got me feeling? What have they got me saying? You've just got to make a serious study of how others are influencing you, both negatively and positively. Now, maybe the influence of all those around you is okay. But just ask yourself. It doesn't hurt to ask. Who am I around? And what are they doing to me? And if you didn't? Now, here's the final question. Is that okay? Maybe the people you associate with and their collective influence is okay. But then again, maybe it's not. All I'm suggesting here is that you take a close and objective look. Everything is worth a second look, especially the power of influence. Positive influence can have an incredible effect on your life, but so can negative influence. Both will take you somewhere, but only one will take you in the direction you truly wish to go. It's so easy just to dismiss the things that influence our lives. The man says, I live here, but I don't think it matters. I'm around these people, but I don't think it hurts. I would take another look at that. I've got a good phrase for you. Everything matters. Now, sure, some things matter more than others, but everything matters. Everything weighs something. So, you've got to keep checking to find out whether associations are tipping the scales toward the positive or toward the negative. It doesn't hurt to look, right? Ignorance is never the best policy. Finding out is the best policy. Remember, part of the purpose of this program is to get us to say, the days of kidding myself are over. I really want to know what I have become and what I'm becoming. I want to know where my strengths and my weaknesses lie. What has power over me? What's influencing me? What have I allowed to affect my life? Perhaps you've heard the story of the little bird. He had his wing over his eye and he was crying. The owl said to the little bird, You're crying? Yes, said the little bird, and he pulled his wing away from his eye. Oh, I see, said the owl. You're crying because the big bird pecked out your eye. And the little bird said, No, I'm not crying because the big bird pecked out my eye. I'm crying because I let him. It's easy to let influences shape our lives, to let associations determine our direction, to let persuasions overwhelm us, to let tides take us, to let pressures make us. The big question is, are we letting ourselves become what we wish to become? In this most important subject of association, here are some actions you may want to take. First, disassociation. After a study of those three questions, who am I around? What are they doing to me? And is that okay? You may come to the serious conclusion that there are some people you just have to break away from. I'm not saying that it's an easy step to take, and it's not to be taken lightly. However, I am saying it may be an essential task. You may just have to make that hard choice not to let certain negative influences affect you anymore. Remember, it could be a choice that saves the quality of your life. The second action you may want to take is limited association. 
It could well be that you are spending too much time in a certain area of your life with a certain group of people. It's easy to put time and effort in the wrong place. The guy spends three hours at the ball game and 30 minutes listening to the sermon. See, that's called out of balance. 30 minutes for spirituality, 3 hours for entertainment. That doesn't weigh well 5 years from now, 10 years from now, when you take a look at the sum total of your values in your life. Here's one of the easy ways to end up with a mediocre average life. Spending major time on minor things. Sophisticated people learn to weigh everything before they spend time or money. You've got to weigh before you pay, whether you're going to spend heavy time or light time. you just got to weigh. Otherwise, if you're not careful, you can get trapped into spending heavyweight time with lightweight people. Now, it's okay to have casual friends, as long as you give them casual time, not serious time. Spend major time with major influence and minor time with minor influence. It's so easy to do just the opposite, but don't let it be said that you fell into that trap. So maybe all you need to do to change some of the influences in your life is not to eliminate them, but merely limit them. Say, I have a good time with these people, but I'm not going to spend days and days with them anymore. I'm just going to cut that down and save some of that time for more major people and more major enterprises. Remember, it's your life. You can spend your time with whomever you want and whenever you want. But you didn't invest in this program for me to kid you. Take a look at your priorities and your values. We have so little time at our disposal. Wouldn't it make sense to invest it wisely? If you have only $100 in your pocket, it's okay to spend $20 for fun and put $80 toward your important values and commitments. But would you be happy reversing those percentages? Better to put the majority of your money where you know it will get you a positive return rather than put it where the taste is brief and the results are poor. Of course, you must be the judge. You must determine whether the situation and the people call for disassociation or limited association. But remember, if it isn't taking you where you want to be five years from now, ten years from now, now is the time to fix it. The third process is the one I most strongly suggest you begin, and that is called expanded association. That is, spending more time with the right people, people of substance and culture, people who understand philosophy and discipline, people of accomplishment and character. Many years ago, Mr. Shove said to me, Mr. Ron, if you truly wish to be successful, you've got to get around the right people. Then he said, it looks like in your present circumstances, you're going to have to plot and scheme. And that was true. I had to plot and scheme to get around the right people. On some of those early opportunities, I had to be around successful people. I would park my car a couple of blocks away. I knew that if they saw my car, I'd never get in. On more than one occasion, I got the question, how did you get here? To which I would respond, oh, someone dropped me off. And that was me dropping me off a couple of blocks away. Whatever you have to do, do it. Keep asking the question, who can I get around? Who could I spend some time with who would have a positive influence on my life? I played every trick in the book I could think of to get around the right people. But it was worth it. Now, here's the surprise. It is possible for a modest investment to get around the major people. If you had a chance to sit down for an hour or two with a wealthy person, and all that you had to do was to pick up the lunch tab, wouldn't that be a bargain? That person might drop an idea on you that could change your life for a lunch tab. And that's where we need to go to get our success plan, from successful people. Don't pick up your plan, especially your financial plan, from unsuccessful people. Here's something else exciting. It's possible for people of modest means to start a wealth plan. You don't have to be wealthy to have a wealth plan. You don't even have to be healthy to start a health plan. All you have to be is smart. Smart enough to say, Hey, I've got the wrong plan, and I'm going to get around someone who has a better plan and make it my plan. So find some successful people to help you fill out your success plan. Find somebody healthy to get your better health plan going. Find somebody living a unique lifestyle to develop your lifestyle plan. This is called association on purpose. Getting around the right people by expanding your circle of influence. I have a really unique friend I'm always trying to find more ways to spend more time with him. He's the big game hunter, millionaire businessman, traveler, and in my opinion, one of the world's great philosophers. He has two special gifts, among many, that make it worth all the time I can possibly spend with him. And those gifts are 1. The ability to absorb. The ability to soak up a day in all of its events. His memory is uncanny. I swear he remembers in detail almost every day of his life and every book he's read. 
I think it is more exciting for him to go to Spain and come back and tell you about it than it is to go yourself. And the reason is, when he's there, he doesn't miss anything. He picks up the sounds and the colors, the experiences and the happenings. He absorbs like a sponge the sights, the people, the whole scene. Then he has the second unique gift, the gift of expression. He can put all he saw and touched and felt into words. Exciting words. When he talks, you can feel the water lapping on your feet. You can see the colors. You can smell the aroma of the flowers and the food. What great gifts to absorb and to express. If I spend a day with him, I get my time's worth. He can put a year into a day's conversation. It leaves you spellbound. He can read a book and, with flawless detail, give you a capsule version and, more often than not, make it more exciting than if you read the book yourself. From Shakespeare to the Beatles, from Africa to Beverly Hills, he's got it recorded and can express it with spirit and precision. You can imagine what a valuable association this is for me. One way to associate with people of influence is through their writings, books, cassette tapes, whatever you can pick up. Maybe you can't meet the person, but you can read his books or listen to his cassettes. Churchill's gone, but he's left some books. Aristotle's gone, but we still have his ideas. Search the catalog for cassettes and libraries for books. Search the magazines. Search the documentaries. They're full of chances for association and intellectual feasting. But in addition to reading and listening, we also need a chance to do some talking and sharing. I have some people in my life with whom I spend time on a regular basis who help me with important life questions, who help me refine my own philosophy, values, and ponder questions about success and lifestyle. We all need associations with people of substance to provide influence concerning major issues. Society, money, enterprise, family, government, love, friendship, culture, taste, opportunity. Community behavior is largely shaped by ideas, and ideas are greatly influenced by education. Education, in turn, is heavily impacted by the individuals we associate with. Therefore, it's crucial not to simply join an easy crowd, but to seek out people who can engage in meaningful discussions about the latest ideas pertaining to philosophy, enterprise, goals, and lifestyle. It's important to surround oneself with individuals who can ask the right questions and challenge one's thinking. One of the most significant influences in my life was my association with Mr. S.C.H. over five years. During this time, he shared invaluable ideas with me in various settings, from dinner conversations to private discussions. His repetition of these ideas and his unique ability to monitor my progress were instrumental in prompting helpful adjustments in my thoughts and actions. As I continued to associate with Mr. S.C.H., I found myself continually growing in experience, knowledge, and accomplishments. This growth enabled me to address fundamental questions with a deeper understanding and appreciation. It became evident that it was my education that was evolving, not the questions themselves. Furthermore, it's essential to strive to become the kind of person that others of quality and substance would want to associate with. This involves developing skills in communication, maintaining a positive attitude, cultivating knowledge, and exercising discipline. By doing so, one can attract valuable individuals who contribute positively to personal growth and development. A true friend is someone who can listen to both good and bad news without judgment or self-centeredness. Surrounding oneself with such individuals is vital for personal and professional fulfillment. Conversely, associating with negative influences can hinder growth and progress, leading to stagnation and dissatisfaction. Achieving balance between professional and personal life is crucial for overall well-being and success. Both aspects require attention, nurturing, and investment to flourish. Neglecting one in favor of the other can lead to dissatisfaction and unhappiness. Setting goals is a fundamental aspect of personal development and success. By consistently setting, evaluating, and refining goals, one can stay focused and motivated to achieve desired outcomes. It's essential to face the future with anticipation rather than apprehension and to actively design a future that aligns with personal aspirations and values. In summary, community behavior, personal growth, and success are all intricately linked to the ideas we are exposed to, the education we receive, and the individuals we associate with. By surrounding ourselves with positive influences, setting meaningful goals, and maintaining balance in all aspects of life, we can strive towards a fulfilling and prosperous future. We refer to these objectives as confidence builders. When you exert effort, burn the midnight oil, and accomplish these minor tasks, 
It bolsters your confidence to pursue your long-term goals. Jot down in your notebook or journal all the little things you would like to achieve or acquire in the next year. How you organize this list is up to you. You may opt to break it down by week or month, whichever suits you best. Part of the satisfaction of having a list is being able to mark off items as achieved or completed. Aim to check off at least one item on your list of short-term goals every week. And when you manage to check off a major milestone on your list of long-term goals, take the time to celebrate. Celebrating milestones is crucial. We grow from both the joy of winning and the pain of losing. It's essential to surround yourself with people who encourage growth and progress. Avoid joining an easy crowd. Instead, seek environments where expectations and performance pressures are high. A consistent plan for acquiring knowledge is vital. Attend lectures, seminars, and engage in discussions with individuals who challenge your thinking and contribute positively to your development. Actively pursue knowledge. Don't wait for good ideas to interrupt you. Seek them out intentionally and be prepared to capture them in a journal or notebook. Developing a detailed plan for the use of your time is crucial for success. Whether it's for work, personal endeavors, or family commitments, having a game plan ensures that you stay focused and productive. Don't start your day, week, or month until you have it planned out. Visualize your future by creating a game plan that outlines your goals and activities. Use graph paper to list your activities and deadlines, ensuring a clear visual representation of your tasks. Keep your game plan visible and refer to it regularly to stay on track. Your game plan should encompass more than just work projects. It should also include time for recreation, reflection, exercise, health, and spirituality. Adapt your schedule to align with your peak productivity times throughout the day. Maintain the discipline of working your plan until it becomes second nature. Your consistent self-discipline is the key to achieving your goals changing your lifestyle, and influencing others positively. Ultimately, the question is not whether you will adopt fundamental disciplines, but when you will do so. With unwavering dedication, we have the power to transform ourselves, our circumstances, and even our nation.